Morning, everyone. We give God praise for the love of God in Jesus Christ, our Lord. This morning, we're going to be in the New Testament letter to Titus. We're going to return to Titus. We're going to be in chapter 1, beginning with verses 1 through 4. Last week, we introduced this letter of Scripture. And we talked about really how at its heart is a sense of unfinished business. And uh, at the heart of that unfinished business is pursuing and finding gospel identity on a godless island. And really, that is our unfinished business. We dare not presume to think ourselves a healthy church. I know people go on about that, but I, 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 do, get, I do weary of that. Who are we to say anything of ourselves when we are not the finished product? Um, we, we, we dare not assume that we have entered into the fullness of gospel identity. Rather, it is and must ever be a continuous pursuit of those who know and love Jesus to realize that we do not know Him enough. And we do not love Him enough, nor could we ever. And yet, we must continually seek to know and love the Lord and Savior more. And that was the... Uh, the Apostle Paul and his ministry that was Titus, this person that he's left in a, a very challenging environment, a godless place, and he is now writing him a letter to encourage him in his ministry. So let's read from chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. And at the proper time, manifested in His Word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior, to Titus, my true child in a common faith. Grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank You that You have in Your mercy and grace revealed everything pertaining to life and godliness herein. So that we may, as we search the Scriptures, we may find the, the ultimate standard of authority for our lives and the, the good and safe ordering thereof. We pray, Lord, that you would help us, that we would not fail to see the immediate importance of the passage at hand. May we not think dismissively of what uh, may seem to some simply to be a, an int introductory greeting, but may we, um, may, may we see and find and enjoy its richness in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you ever feel discouraged, disheartened, despairing, hopeless, helpless? Uh, maybe in your life you're familiar with these feelings at times. Maybe that th these are things that come up in your workplace or things that um, you experience when you're doing an exam. You know, I... I um, as we were sat over there, I had um, a, just a, a flashback to a dream that I have on a recurring basis, which is absolutely terrifying, where I am stood in front of all of you, and uh, I have not prepared anything. I have no idea what I'm going to say. And um, those who, who know me well know that sometimes in uh, difficult and pressured situations. I have been called upon to preach, and I think that I know the Scriptures well enough that I can work my way through a passage and open it up and read it and then start explaining it and kind of wing it. But uh, all powers of winging it fail me in this dream. And it's hyper-realistic. I actually wake up in a state of um, a heart racing and cold sweat because I have let you down, I've let um, the, the Lord down. And you know what, just to add that little layer of insult to it, my parents show up and, um, uh, and, and other people that I, I love and have respected over the years walk into the room unannounced and I just am in a state 
uh, and uh, normally it's uh, at that point that I, everything is disintegrating around me and stuff's kicking off outside and, and you lot aren't listening at all and uh, not that I'm giving you anything really to listen to. It is... Um, a despairing moment. Now that's a dream, but uh, they, they say that your dreams, your nightmares, and maybe that's a, some people have more like horror film type scenarios in their nightmares. Being bad at communicating God's word is mine. Um, when, when, I, when I have that, it's actually reflective of the little moments that I might have in the course of a week or in the course of ministry where I know it's not just I feel, I know I'm out of my depth. I know that I'm in way over my head. I know that the power is not from me and the wisdom is not mine. And I, for a moment, sense that very keenly in myself. And so, of course, I dream that and I sit there for a bit and then I wake up and I thank God for His sufficiency because that was, that was a, a relief that, that didn't play out. While we were singing just a moment ago, though, I, um, I quickly reached for my iPad and I, I, I was like, oh no, did I, did I, um, did I sync the, the notes app and all of that? And I thought, well, I know the text, so I ought to be able to communicate it to you. All of that is born out of perhaps my own insecurities and my own fears of failure and awareness of weakness. If we are human, I think we feel those things uh, at some degree in our life. And sometimes the ones that tell you, I don't fear anything, I'm not anxious, they are actually the most, <laughs> the most fearful and anxious and unsettled in themselves. And so um, all such people can have pity, really, because they, they might be particularly troubled. Titus, in all probability, felt at times very alone, felt very despairing, felt, well, what if I just give this up? Uh, some of you probably had exams recently. Uh, I don't know about you, but when I had exams, uh, I would sometimes be writing and I would get this horrible pain in my wrist and my fingers and I, what if I just put the pencil down and stopped answering? What? What would the consequences of that be? What would actually happen? And sometimes in life we have that attitude of what if I were to just, you know, quiet quit. Just give it up. Just sit back. But what happens, happen. And, um, you know, deal with the consequences or not later. So we, we face these, uh, these feelings, these thoughts, the, these intrusive thoughts, uh, or sometimes more entertained and welcome uh, throughout the course of any given day or week. Titus left on Crete may very well have, have thought about that, that the implications of what Paul says in verse 5, left on Crete. He might, he might not simply have felt left for a purpose, but rather left behind, lost, alone, afraid, a leaderless, lawless, and loveless island that did not know the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever your experience in your workplace or your, your school or wherever, when it comes to our walk with the Lord and our ministries, the various things that God has given each one of us to do in our lives in honor of Him and in service to Him, we can have these same thoughts. And so what we must do is again and again, we must return to the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no hope for us apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ. There, there, there is no sufficiency apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ. We aren't going to make it apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the first thing that we see in this passage really relates to gospel identity. Knowing who you are in Jesus Christ. Paul knows who he is and he knows who Titus is. He says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to be clear, Paul does not find his identity in being a servant, 
nor in being an apostle. Rather, he finds his identity in the God of whom he is a servant and the the Christ by whom he is an apostle. But you cannot, when you have found God and when you have found Jesus, detach the gifts of the Lord to you from the Lord Himself. He has given that to you. Therefore, as we obediently pursue the practice and the use of those gifts in our lives and ministries, we are doing so as those under His authority. So Paul is not writing this for Titus. First, he's writing it for the Lord as a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Titus is not receiving this for Paul. Oh, well, it's Paul and Paul is writing and Paul's a friend and so I need to hear him out on this. No, he's receiving this as one who is identified. Read it in verse 4. By the apostle Paul as my true child in a common faith. And Paul's not saying this is my biological son. But rather, Titus has walked with Paul. Titus, in all all probability, was converted under Paul's ministry and has walked with Paul, ministered alongside Paul, and now is raised to a place of spiritual maturity and Paul's able to leave him on a really terrible island. So, my true child, not full stop, but my true child in a common faith. We believe in the same Lord. We have the same faith. We have been washed in the same baptism. We have one God and Father over all. We're together. We're family. So, Paul, as he's speaking, speaks not from himself, but from God, from Jesus Christ, as a servant, as an apostle, that is one who is called and sent. He's writing to Titus, who is one who has come to faith under his ministry. And it's not all about Paul and his ministry. Rather, he's my true child in a common faith. Faith is not inwardly focused. Faith is outwardly focused. So so Paul is saying we have a relationship based on who we are in Jesus Christ. We'll learn more about Titus as we go through this, this letter. But... As we read the the verses in between, Paul identifying himself and then identifying the recipient of the letter, there's other things that come out. For example, he, he says, for the sake of the faith of God's elect. Now, this whole concept of being elect is being chosen. So Paul is saying, you are chosen. He speaks of God as our Father. So he's saying you are adopted. He speaks of God and Jesus as our Savior. So you are saved. God is your Father. Christ is your Savior. You are brought into a family worth representing and a fellowship worth sharing. As those who are chosen, adopted, and saved under the Lord. Gospel identity. Do you know who you are this morning? Do you know how you are who you are? Do you know where you stand in Jesus Christ? Maybe maybe we know each other well and we know that we have right relationship with God in Christ. Therefore, that means if we have that relationship vertically with God, we ought to have a reconciled relationship with each other horizontally. That is, what God has done to bring us to Him to repair that separation, He has done between us in our relationships to bring us together into the fellowship of His people. Paul, writing from some other place, Titus left on this island to serve the Lord there. What brings them together across the the distance? God. Jesus Christ. Our God and Father, our Savior. God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Savior. Gospel identity will help you when otherwise you might despair. But not only do we see gospel identity, we also see gospel activity. Paul says he is a servant. He is an apostle. 
One who is called and sent. One who represents. So, why is he serving God and representing Jesus Christ? Titus is, he simply called my true child in a common faith here. But as we go forward, we do see that he's doing a very similar ministry. Why are they serving God? Why are they representing Jesus Christ? The answer is very clearly in the text. Remember what I said about being chosen. It's not just Paul and it's not just Titus who are chosen to be a part of God's family. There are others. It's not all about them. In fact, their lives bear out the truth that it is not about you. And you're going to have to break that in your mind. If you have any concept of that in your life, that, oh, I have my life. Paul said, your life is hidden with God in Christ. Paul said, Jesus is your life, and when He appears, we will appear with Him in glory. Uh, you're, you're, you're like, oh, I have my, my... What I want, what I expect... What, you want to set the rules. You want to make the agenda, to set the agenda, and to do things by your schedule. That's not what Paul and Titus were doing. That's not what the early church was doing. And when they were doing that, they were called up on it. But before we even get to the functions of that, we have to know who we are. Are we chosen? And when we know that we are chosen, we realize, wait a second, God's, God's plan doesn't revolve around me. It doesn't even revolve around other people. It is actually that the nations come to know Him. And so as if that's going to happen, we have to go and someone might say, find those that God has chosen. Actually, that's, that's above our pay grade. We can't do that. We are supposed to go and communicate the good news of Jesus Christ to all so that whoever believes will be saved. So Paul says that he is a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Why? For the sake of the faith of God's elect. He does what he does so that God's chosen people will have faith. How will they believe if they have not heard? How will they hear unless there is one who is sent who speaks to them? It's not simply so that they will have faith. It's so that they will know the truth. When Jesus commissioned His disciples at the uh, end of His earthly ministry, prior to His ascension into heaven, He said, go into all the world, or as you are going into all the world, because it's presumed they will be scattered, they will be going, make disciples. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But it doesn't stop there. This is a, a big problem with sometimes our evangelism and missions. The aim, it's not even making disciples. Sometimes the aim is getting someone to profess faith in Christ, baptize them, move on to the next person that we can lead to trust in Jesus, baptize them, move on to... But what about making disciples? And what about... Teaching them to obey all things that Christ has commanded. It's extremely important that as we go about the missionary task, as we go about the, the evangelistic responsibility, that as we go about fulfilling the promise of Jesus Christ to be His witnesses to the ends of the earth, we have to realize that it's not enough for us to just say, okay, they, they have faith, they believe in God. And move on to the next person who doesn't. So that they do. But rather so that they know the truth. Which is to have not simply an intellectual appreciation for facts. But to have an intimate relationship with all that can be known about God. About Jesus. And His design for us. As believers. As members of a local church. And as parts of the, the wider body of Jesus Christ. His desire is that not only they will have faith, but they will know the truth. And as they grow therein, as they, they, they have knowledge of the truth, it's also this, so that God's chosen people will be characterized by godliness. Faith, growth, 
in knowing God and knowing His Word and knowing what we can about Him and what that means for us, inevitably, through Titus, we see, leads to a place where the gospel that we know, the God that we know, the gospel that we believe transforms us. Godliness is fruit of the gospel. Godliness is fruit of knowing God. It's deeply disillusioning and disheartening when the Lord's people or those who are called by His name are so out of step with the Lord. Again, I think this has to do with a a consumer approach to God. We only go to Him when we need Him, and we don't always feel that we need Him. When we're sick, when we're particularly aware of our sin, and the more we sin, the less aware we become of that, more callous, more cold. Um, when When we're just feeling a bit poorly, not great, or empty, that's when people, you know, they, they suddenly have a burst of spiritual energy. It's really, it's really upsetting that there are some that you can know, you can know something really bad has gone wrong when you see a particularly enthusiastic burst. Think about it yourself as a child. Well, maybe it's just me. If I had done something um, in the day, I knew that my mother's discipline was, how can I put that delicately, Um, not as intimidating or lasting with me as my father's, okay? But my father was coming, and I had to do what I could to appease his wrath, to satisfy the demands of justice before it was worked out, okay? So sin has a consequence, has a price that has to be paid. And if I could do something to really lay on the affection thick, but he could see it. It was obvious. If I was there in a sort of hyperactive, enthusiastic to see you huggy state at the door, what have you done? Was generally the reaction. And I hate to say it, but um, there, are, there are times that I believe we, when we go to our Heavenly Father, He might, knowing full well, nonetheless, as He asked various people throughout Scripture, might ask a question. What have you done? Is, is, that, is that a right approach to worshiping God? Is it right that we only show up when we need Him? Well, it depends on how you frame that because are we not always in need of Him? Or have we lied when we say, I need you, oh, I need you, every hour I need you? In which case, we're lying to God. Pretty serious. So, do we need Him? Okay, yes, we do. Are we dependent upon Him? Yes. But is the, only, is the nature of our relationship a, a one-lane street? Someone was telling me about their, their um, relationship this past week, and uh, yeah, they just felt it was very one-sided. That they're giving and not receiving anything back. Can we not be that way with God? Where, where we're, uh, Lord, I need, we, our, our prayers are not, they're, they're, there's not adoration, There's not thanksgiving. There might be confession. But when we confess, we couch our confessions in explanations for why we did what we did. And trust that the Lord will understand. And there definitely is a lot of supplication. Lord, give me this. Lord, do that. How is that? I've said it many times before and I must say it again. God is not a cosmic vending machine. You plug in some coin, you press the buttons, and then you get a result. God is the Creator. He's worthy of our worship and our praise. God is the Savior. He is worthy of our adoration. God God is everything that we are not. 
And it's not about you or me or anyone else. It is about Him. Stop patronizing God. Stop trivializing God. Stop, stop brushing God over to, to the side. He is the God who makes servants. He is the God who calls and sends apostles. He is the God who has chosen a people for Himself. He is the God who gives faith so that the people whom He has chosen believe and are saved. He is the God of truth who leads us into truth so that we might be set free by the truth having come to know it. He is the God after whom godliness is called. He is the God who, who gives us hope of eternal life because He is the only one who is truly eternal back into the past and forever into the future, the very essence of it. He is the one who never lies, whose promises are real and true and are kept. He is the one who entrusts people with a good message to proclaim and is able with actual authority, not assumed power, to command and be obeyed. He is God our Savior. He is the one in whom there is a common faith that brings us together. And He is the one in whom we are reborn and by whom we are reborn. He is the one who distributes grace and peace as Father and as Savior. The Cretans had a man, Zeus, who became God. God became man so that we might know and embrace the grace and peace of God. And that leads to godliness. That changes us. That's how we, we move from, from, from Cretans to Christians. Titus' job is not to make Christians. Titus' job is to point Cretans to Jesus Christ. And Christ makes Christians. It accords with godliness. And that's what we see in the passage before us. Gospel activity is all consumed with the glory of God, with the proclamation of the good news of God, and the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, so that those whom God has chosen to save will be saved at the appointed time. And how? How is this done? How does this happen? Through the preaching, he says, with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. Do not diminish the importance of communicating the good news of Jesus Christ. Preaching is a, a, can be a very specific word, and sometimes people limit the language of preaching unhelpfully to just what one person does up here. Of course, we should respect that. We should understand that God has chosen and set aside certain people with certain giftings for the communication of the gospel in particular settings. But the preaching of the good news of Jesus is entrusted to each of you. Men and women, old and young, who have believed in Jesus Christ and know He is risen. So proclaim it. What we've done is we have institutionalized preaching, and we have individualized preaching around the preacher. And we've made the preacher synonymous with the pastor. And we actually don't have any indication in this particular letter that Titus was a pastor. History does relate, or church tradition relates, that he became a pastor, bishop of the church at Crete. Okay, that's, that's great, terrific. But at this point, I believe quite substantially, there's clear indications that his role was primarily one of an evangelist, or if we were to use modern language, a church planter. He's looking after lots of churches and communities with the view that they are equipped for the work of ministry, are established, and are serving so that the island is reached with the gospel of Christ. That involves preaching. Paul is preaching. Titus is preaching. And he's calling people, as we see, to engage in the work of preaching. Thus, later in chapter 2, we are, we are told that the older men are to teach and instruct the younger men. Older women are to instruct the younger women. There is this message that is proclaimed so that people are led 
to Jesus, to the Savior, and to his commands. Gospel activity. Why do we serve? Why do we represent Jesus? So that God's chosen people will have faith, will know the truth, and will be characterized by godliness. That's, that's it. It's not about me. It's about him and his plan. And that is done through the preaching that God has entrusted to his people, which is the message of Jesus Christ and him crucified, risen, exalted, interceding, and returning. Gospel activity. Gospel longevity. We really need this when we're on a godless island and we're beset by all sorts of things that are going on. One of the major things that people say about city ministry, I was reading a a thread on Twitter this week. Someone had asked about um, unique challenges of urban ministry. And uh, I, I saw some people saying the transient nature of the city. I find, I find that always very interesting and a bit frustrating because there are people who've lived in this area for decades. And I, I'm, I'm a bit tired of churches moping about because, oh, you know, people are always coming and going. They're always moving. Yes, and there's a lot of people who are staying and have stayed for a long time. What about them? Who's discipling them? Who's reaching them? Sometimes they're harder. They're actually harder to reach. People who know they're moving, they, don't, they, they can't be too picky. But people who are stuck in an area realize, oh, if I'm going to get invested there, I've got to know that it has soil my roots can go down into. And that can be more challenging. We have to be in it for the long haul. Now, I, I've, um, to say I've resigned myself to the reality makes it sound like it's a... Uh, it's a punishment. I, I believe that, that God has called me here. And I am here. I was, you know, our church history has a bit of a complicated thread, uh, multiple threads actually. But I was a part of that group that started in a library hall. And some of you were part of the group that was met here. And I think I'm the last from that library hall group, and some of you are still around from the group that was sat here, but that was 19 years ago when I met with that group in a library hall. And 19 years of hard work, 19 years of gospel ministry, 19 years of planting other churches, helping revitalize other churches, 19 years of evangelism and ministry, 19 years of loving my neighbor, 19 years of seeking to be a faithful Christian, never mind a Christian ser- servant. 13 years in pastoral ministry here now. It will be 10 years as your pastor. Why? Because I think if anything's going to get done, sometimes it's worth doing it properly and worth sticking around and and, and really growing roots and being faithful. That's not easy. It's quite challenging at times. Sometimes the easiest thing is to go away. Those of you who have learned my boundaries, know that Monday is my day off, and I tend to quite literally get away on that day. I'll leave the area if I can. My phone is on silent. If I choose to check it, I will, but I probably won't. And if I do, I won't respond. I'll click unread so you don't know I've seen it. Why? Because I have to get away for moments so that I can be here for the long haul. Each of you have rhythms in your life that help you get, keep going, keep you saying. Some of you have been in the same jobs for years and years, um, and, and uh, others know that you know, living in the same area, in the same place, you have to have mechanisms that keep you anchored, rooted. So the question is for us, what keeps us going What keeps us rooted? What keeps us anchored in Christian community, whether that be here or somewhere else? What will keep you in your ministry when you feel alone? What will keep you in your ministry when you feel like 
everything's against you and you're very isolated and you're not sure that there's anyone around who believes what you believe, when you know God is Father but no one else does, when you know Christ is Savior but no one else does, when you feel that your faith is frail, when you feel that your life is threatened, whatever the case may be, what keeps you going? What keeps Titus going on a leaderless, lawless, and loveless island? What keeps Paul going after all the stuff he's been through? Because he's writing this after his first Roman imprisonment. So after all of these tortuous things that he's described prior to that even in um, uh, 2 Corinthians, which we finished not that long ago, and all these brutal experiences, what kept him going? It's in the text. The hope of eternal life. You won't find gospel longevity in yourself. That's why it's called gospel longevity. It's not your own staying power. It's His. It's His sustaining power. And so you go and and, and find in the Lord the hope of eternal life. Which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. And then he says, at the right time. You notice the time references here. At the right time, proper time, manifested in his word through the preaching with which I've been entrusted. God is from all eternity. And... God from all eternity who has had a plan for your eternal life from all eternity has stepped into our time and in our space in the person and work of Jesus Christ so that we can have that hope. And it is a hope that helps to know that not only is it not all about me, but it's not all about this. So our individualism and our consumerism are crucified, but also our materialism. Because this will pass away. This will all decay. I know we, we live like we will live forever. The stuff that we, we, we act, we pretend like these structures that are around us will always stand. They won't. They don't. Our city is crumbling. But God is from eternity. And He has hope that is for eternity. And so we live now, not in light of this present decay, we live in light of eternity. We live in the hope of eternal life. My eternal life, the eternal life of the people who are chosen by God, and the true eternal life of God who from all ages past. It's just eternity. Hope. And for those who are believing in Jesus Christ, that hope of eternal life is, is that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. It, it, it is that um, we believe in our heart and we confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and He's risen from the dead. And we will be saved. And we, if, if we will be saved, we will be sustained. We are kept by... Jesus. We are kept for Jesus. And because we're kept by Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit and kept for Jesus at the appearance of His coming, we can keep on because we're not alone. Gospel longevity. That's what will keep Paul. That's what has kept Paul. That's what will keep Titus. The hope of eternal life. But there's one other thing that I want to show you to encourage you with lest there's anyone still doubting. And that's, we've we've looked at at gospel identity, gospel activity, gospel longevity. I want, want everyone here to have gospel surety. Know the truth. Know who you are. Know what you're called to do what you're gifted with, and what you might not feel gifted with, but which is a responsibility for you as a follower of Jesus. Know 
where God has put you and why and for how long and for what purpose. No. And know what it's all about. It's not about you. It's not even about this or them. It's about Him. Trusting God's promises. God who never lies promised. Do you remember what I was telling you as we introduced Titus last week um, about their, their man who became God, their version of the Greek god Zeus? He became a god through lies, through treachery, through deceit. And as he began, so he continued. He was, after all, created in the image of the people of this island. Always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. He was a liar, he was an evil beast, and he was a lazy glutton. There's no two ways about it. Always. That was part of his character, and they loved that. They celebrated that. They told stories about that. He's, not, he's no God at all. The one true God, who's made Himself known to us powerfully and personally in Jesus Christ, our Lord. He is our Lord. He is our Father. He's our Savior. He is God, and He never lies. And because He never lies, we can trust His promises. We can trust that God chose to save people and He has promised that He will save people for Himself. Otherwise, what is the point of His choice? We, we know that God has promised eternal life. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard what the Lord has prepared for those who love Him. And those who love Him are those who have been loved by Him. Yet God has promised. And... and we, we're not only trusting in, in uh, this gospel surety is not just in God's promises because that's, that's something that's said. And, and when our gods have let us down, and when the idols of this world are liars, and when we let ourselves down and we let others down and we mess everything up, this world is dishonest, what one says doesn't carry a lot of weight. But God doesn't only say, He does. So we have not only His promises, but we have His power. And it's all throughout just those four verses. You were like, oh, this is an introductory passage. It's just an introduction. It's a greeting. No, it's filled with testimony of God's power. God appointed Paul as his servant. God appointed Paul as an apostle. God gave him a purpose. God gave him promises. God gave him the pattern of preaching so that others might be saved. God is the Savior of Paul and of Titus. Paul, Paul over, he's not just there, read Acts correctly. He's not just hanging out and sees a man killed. He's not just saying, oh, let me watch her. He was presiding over the murder of one of the first deacons. He had a legal background. He was there in a lawful capacity. And if anyone has any doubts about that, the lawyer Paul, watching on as this man is brutally murdered in the streets, then goes through the legal processes to imprison and murder others. Such that Jesus says, you're persecuting me. And Paul later says, I persecuted the church of Christ. I'm the chief of sinners. God saved him. Titus. It saved through Paul's ministry. Uh, this man who killed people, who killed early Christians, who killed one of the first deacons and evangelists, is now writing a letter of encouragement to an evangelist that's operating under his oversight. Is that not remarkable? God saves. The power of the risen Christ is seen in his life. God, God is, is not only Savior, He's the sustainer. And so we can say, not only is He the sustainer of Savior and sustainer of Paul and Titus, He is the Savior and sustainer of you and me. Now, as we pursue gospel identity in this church on a godless island, we know that God gives grace and peace. This is not grace and peace from me. 
This is grace and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Savior. And how much we need grace and how much we need peace. He gives grace and peace in our time of need, which is always. So when our strength is fading, when the light in our eyes grows dim, when we feel more hopeless than hopeful, when we are not sure we are being helpful, but we know we need help, yet we lack the appropriately called, qualified, and capable helpers, when our leaderless, lawless, and loveless island is full of dishonest, debauched, and socially self-destructive individuals, when you fear looking more like the culture than like Christ and you despair, when you fear the marginalizing repercussions of looking more like Christ than like the culture, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace from God our Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. That's what will keep you going. That's what will keep me going. That's where we find our identity. That's how we pursue our activity. That's, that's how we find our longevity. And that's how we know gospel surety because God is gracious and He gives us His peace and He saves to the uttermost all who believe in Him and He will sustain you. He will keep you as you trust in Him. Let's pray. Father, how much we need You. Uh, forgive us for just not taking you seriously. Forgive us for, not, for taking you and your people for granted. Forgive us for neglecting your calling on our life and leaving the capabilities that you've given to us and throwing away the qualifications you've given us spiritually and just the ways that we look more like this this culture than like Christ. Forgive us of all of that. Wash it all away and help us to know who we are in Jesus Christ. And knowing who we are, may we get on with doing what you've called us to do. Give us the strength in Jesus' name. Amen.